it's week 11 or week 10 or something. I don't know what we call the week anymore, but it's the last week of lectures. Are you guys excited about that? Yeah. Let's go. What are you trying to say? You don't like my class? <laughs> You're excited for my class to be over? <laughs> I'm very upset to hear this. You should have booed and hissed. And, right, there should be weeping in this crowd. Come on, show me some love. Um, no, just kidding. I mean, I, I know we're all looking forward to the winter break. We're getting down to the home stretch. There's one week of lectures left. A week from today, early in the morning, you're going to take a final exam for our class. Uh, later today, I'm going to post some practice exams and study materials that you can look at. So check out those. You'll see announcement on the front page of the website when those are up. Um, mostly covering, focusing on the material that we've studied since the midterm. Uh, yeah. So haven't really focused much on the exam. I'm going to talk a little more about the exam on Wednesday and Friday, less today. Um, today we're going to talk about sorting. And today's content will be the last content that I would possibly test you on on the final. So like Wednesday, I'm going to talk about basically what you would do if there were no Stanford uh, libraries to use. If you just had to write real, regular C++, what, how would you survive? What would you do? Um, and I also talk about a certain kind of library, particular to a smart pointer library that you might be interested in. So anyway, after that lecture, if you were to go off and work at a company or internship that did C++, you might know a little more how to, how to do that, because most companies don't use our Stanford library classes. Um, then on Friday, that'll be our very last lecture. I'm going to do some wrap up and talk about like what we learned and, and, and some advice to you guys on things you might want to do after this class. I'm also going to talk about the final exam a little bit, do a little bit of reviewing of kind of what's going to be on there, and go over some topics and take questions about that and stuff. So that, that's kind of the plan for this week. Um, and you know, you guys have homework eight due on Friday, so hopefully you guys are, are working on that. Just a quick question, who's, who's done with homework eight already? Not very many. OK, who hasn't started yet? I know there's some people who just aren't raising their head. And they're like, I don't want to admit it. That's OK. That's cool. You don't have to have started yet. But you got till Friday, so keep an eye on that. Uh, OK, well, anyway, that's where we're at so far. I'm going to teach you about sorting today. Um, how many of you have already learned about sorting before? Yeah? What sorting algorithms have you learned about? Bogo sort. Bogo sort, <laughs> bubble sort. Wow. OK. Well, I'm going to. I'm going to mostly assume that you haven't seen it, but I'm also going to try to teach it in a 106x kind of way. So I'm going to try to go a little fast through it. But um, you know, whatever. It's fine if you've learned a little bit of sorting before. Hopefully, I'll tell you some stuff today that you didn't know, even if you've seen sorting before. So OK, here we go. Sorting. <laughs> what is sorting? It's when you rearrange things into order. <laughs> wow. Well, um, I mean, I think we have this this sense of there being an order that you would sort things into. Like if you're sorting ints, you sort them by numerical order. If you're sorting strings, you sort them by alphabetical order or something like that, right? So we have this sense that like data types inherently have an order that associates with them. And for some types, that might be mostly true, like ints and maybe strings and so forth. You might call that a natural ordering. Although, I just want to be clear, you could sort things into a different order. Like if you wanted to sort your strings by length, all the short ones first and all the long ones later, that's still sorting. It's just sorting them by a different ordering uh, you know, arrangement, right? That still counts as sorting. And actually, a lot of sorting libraries or algorithms will allow you to sometimes specify, like, how do I tell which ones come before which other ones so that you can uh, adjust the ordering that it gets sorted into. But anyway, there are, one of the things, I mean, sorting often gets taught in introductory computer science classes like this one. And, um, that might seem a little strange because it's kind of a solved problem. Like, you know, sorting, you just usually call some library function and it sorts and then you're done and you don't think about it very much after that. And so it, it kind of probably seems a little bit mundane or, or, or not worth covering or something like that. But I think one of the reasons that, you know, we like to teach it to you guys is because it's a problem that can be solved a zillion different ways. And a lot of those ways are clever and have interesting ideas in them, interesting algorithmic concepts in them. It's great for talking about big O, runtime, time and space trade-offs. You can talk about other topics like parallelization. You can talk about giant scale. How does Google sort a trillion web pages or whatever? You know, like you can talk about a lot of things through the, the category of sorting. So anyway, I'm going to just blaze through several different sorting algorithms that are commonly used or commonly known. We talk about them and talk about their 
pros and cons. Um, so <laughs> my personal favorite sorting algorithm is called BOGO sort. It's supposed to sound like bogus, like it's a bogus sorting algorithm. But it's not bogus, it's correct, it totally works. The algorithm is the following. If the list is sorted, you are done. If not, <laughs> shuffle the values and repeat. So <laughs> shuffle them up and hope that you happen to shuffle them into perfectly sorted order. It's not the smartest or fastest sorting algorithm, but it does work, right, eventually. <laughs> as long as you randomly eventually find the sorted ordering, it will work, right? So, I mean, people show this as an example of a really silly algorithm that would still eventually find the right answer, assuming that we have a nice distribution of random numbers, right? Um, okay, so how long does it take? <laughs> What's the big O of this algorithm on average? I mean, you have to talk about worst, worst case, it could never find it, right? Because you randomly pick the wrong answer forever. But let's assume kind of, if you looked at all the space of all the things the algorithm could do, kind of like what's the average case runtime? Do you have an answer, Lexi? Yeah. Factorial. factorial, why do you say that? I think that might be right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, think of it like the number of different orderings here, or I guess I also think of it in terms of probability. Like if you had, a, I think of it like a deck of cards. Imagine you shuffle a deck of cards. What are the odds that you sort it as ace, two, three, four, five? You know, what are the odds? Well. It's kind of like, what's the odds that the first card is the right first card? The deck has 52 cards. So the odds of that being the right first card are kind of one out of 52, right? And then what are the odds that the next card is the right second card? You might say one out of 52 again, but that's if you haven't taken a probability class. Like 109, you'd learn, like, it's not one out of 52. Again, it's, you already used the one, so it's one out of 51, right? So you're kind of multiplying one out of 52 times one out of 51 times one out of 50, all the way down to the last card. If the first 51 cards are in the right order, then the last card, in, by definition, must be the right one. So that's one out of one. So yeah, it's kind of like one over 52 factorial. That's the odds you're going to get it right. And so if that's the odds you're going to get it right, you sort of flip that over. And yeah, sort of like n factorial is about how long it's going to take you to get the right one, roughly speaking. So here's the code. I actually wrote this algorithm. <laughs> um, actually, I, I hired a subcontractor from Berkeley to write it. Uh, it took them uh, you know, three quarters of uh, full-time work, and they got this for me. And um, whatever. So uh, you know, while not sorted, shuffle. And then is sorted, I just loop over and see if the neighbors are in order or not all the way across. Actually, the hardest part of this algorithm is the shuffling part. Like, if you don't have a shuffling function, I, we haven't really talked about this, but like, how do you shuffle the elements of a, an array or a vector if you don't have a library function to do so? Do you know? You want to jumble them up, and you don't have any magic library that will do it for you. you have any ideas? What do you think? Well, if you have some sort of randomness, I don't know if this is the best way to do it, but one way to do it would just be to uh, pick a random element in the list, pull it out, put it in a new list, uh, and then repeat. Take another new random element from your list. Now now you're choosing from n minus 1 element. Put in your new list and do that over and over. Yeah, I think the basic idea is to like start with the list in its original order and do random things to it. Either randomly pluck elements out and put them into the result or randomly pick pairs of elements and swap them and something like that. Although for reasons that are, I don't have time for, you have to be careful because if you do it a little bit wrong, you end up with a non-even probability. If you do it right, all 52 cards have a one in 52 equal chance of being in each of the 52 spots. But if you do your randomness wrong, you weight the probabilities too far to one end or the other. Stay tuned, you'll learn more about that kind of stuff in the 103, 109 uh, theoretical computer science courses. But anyway, here's a, here's a, oh, I don't have the slide with the shuffling code, do I not? Whatever, anyway, I thought I had the next slide with the shuffle code. But basically the algorithm that a lot of people do is they loop over the list, for each index they pick an element ahead of it and they swap them. And you just walk the list and do that, and then when you're done, you're swapped. Now, your algorithm's fine, like pulling things out, except that it just kind of takes more memory of making an auxiliary structure and building it up. This thing just kind of swaps people in place, and it, it kind of does the same thing. But those are fine ideas. Anyway, that's Bogusort. Do you want to see Bogusort? <laughs> I have a, a zip of this on the class webpage. I'm pretty sure I have Bogusort here. Yeah, Bogusort. So here it is. And, oh, I guess I must have, do I, do I not have the, so yeah, there's the shuffling algorithm. Start from the zero and go to the length, pick a random number from there to the end, and if you've picked a different index, then swap them. 
uh, whatever. Anyway, um, so uh, Bogo sort. So I have a main here, main. And my main, I'm, you know, if you want to look at this code later, you can. But basically, what I do is I make vectors of different sizes. I fill them with randomly chosen numbers, and then I run the sorting algorithm on them, and I see how long it'll take. So let's do Bogo sort. And I can adjust what the size limits are here. So let's start with like two and go up to like twenty. And instead of times two, let's do n plus plus. I see your hand up. I'll call you just one second. Uh, run. Here we go. It was doing pretty well until nine. Uh oh. <laughs> hmm. Sorry, you had a question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, in the algorithm for like blocking the first order string, there's something like if you have specific code code to encode code, like spatial type or Oh, that was some kind of string shuffling code. Yeah, I jumped into the wrong thing, I think. But, but anyway, the idea is right. You have index i and j, you pick a random j, and you swap them or something. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to let it run any farther. It's pretty weird that it like jumps so much from here to here. Some of that is literally just the randomness part of it. But this is a horrible sort. I mean, it takes four seconds to sort 10 things, right? My little brother can sort faster than that, so come on. Um, OK, so I'm going to close that. It is factorial. I think you're right about the average case runtime. This one's just silly. Let's, let's just move on. Let's move on. So OK. Here's one that's less silly, but it's still kind of mediocre. It's called selection sort. Selection sort is where you walk across the array or the vector, you find the smallest element in the vector, and you move it to the front. So like this is the original data. I walk the whole thing. I look for the smallest value. I think that's negative 4 in index 3. So once you find it, you swap it to the front. Now I want to be careful. Swap, I'm not talking about vector like remove and shift and then insert and shift. Shifting is expensive. We don't want to shift. So we find it, and we just swap its value with the value at the front, OK? Swap, not shift. So now, after we've done that, you can think of it as like this one element is now the sorted subportion of the array. And now we repeat. We look for the next smallest one, and we swap them into index 1. And so I think that's the 2. Is that right? So the 2 swaps over from index 12. And now the first two indexes are the sorted subcomponent, and we look for the third smallest element. We swap them to index two, and so forth. You just keep doing this until the whole thing is sorted. OK? What do you think? Uh, here's the code, basically. You could write it slightly different ways. but So for each index i, start at i and walk to the end and look for the smallest value in that area of the array. We'll call that index min. And then once we find a min, if a min isn't already at the right spot, swap it into the right spot. Okay? What is the big O of this algorithm? N squared. N squared? Why do you say that? Yeah, Because it walks the list once for every index, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, the sort of simple answer is, well, it's got two for loops that are nested inside of each other, and they both go up to like the vector size. Um, and yeah, I mean, your answer was a little better because just having two loops doesn't always, you know, you guys, I tricked you guys with these big old questions on the midterm, right? And two loops doesn't always mean n squared. But yeah, this one goes to size. This one goes to size. That looks pretty n squared to me. Now, of course, it doesn't go from zero to size and from zero to size. It, this one goes from zero, but this one goes like i plus one to size, right? And so the fact that it's less than uh, n for the inner loop, I, I think we've talked about this before, right? Uh, that, um, that if you have nested loops, that the outer loop goes n times, and the inner loop goes like n, and then the next time the inner loop goes n minus 1, and then the next time it goes n minus 2, and the next time it goes n minus 3, or something like that, right? Then ultimately you end up with a triangle. I can't draw straight lines, but you end up with a triangle of runtime. So n squared would have been the whole rectangle, but this is like almost exactly half of that, so it's n squared over 2. We know from big O, n squared over 2 is still big O of n squared. So this algorithm is big O of n squared. So yeah, that's how a uh, long selection sort takes to run. Pretty simple to understand, though, right? Simple algorithm, n squared runtime. OK? So yeah, I mean, we could run it and measure it, I guess. Uh, here, uh, instead of bogus sort. Oh, I was supposed to, I wanted to like save these. <laughs> Let's. Um, Let's save some runtimes here. Uh, don't read that. Uh, so here's BOGO. Boom. Selection sort. Let's do selection sort. And then 
Where do I do that? Selection sort. Okay, here it goes. Oh wait, you know, I'm sorting like 10 elements because I, I had it calibrated for the BOGO sort. So it should be n times two, and the initial size should be like, I don't know, 10, and the final size should be like 100,000 or something, I don't know what. So what I want you to see is that if I double the size of the array, the runtime goes up by almost exactly a factor of four, right? That's because two squared is four. This runtime is proportional to the square of the change of the input size, right? So if I, I mean, I, but I guess, like, I, I see this a lot where people go, oh, n squared means the runtime goes up by four. And it's like, well, that's only because I was doubling the array size. If I was, like, taking these sizes times 10 over here, then what happens over here? times 100, right, it would go from 20 to 2,000, or what, it would go up by a factor of 100, yeah. So it's, it's 2, 4, because 4 is a square of 2. So yeah, that's kind of the runtime we end up with here. Okay, cool. So that's selection sort runtime. And you know, the runtime here is okay. We can sort 10,000 things in the time it took Bogo sort to sort, like what was it, 9 or 10 things. That was a little bit better. Um, okay, let's look at another sorting algorithm. That one is n squared, I believe myself. Um, so insertion sort, I think this one is the one that most humans use when they have to sort physical items. Like when I gather up tests after, <laughs> after a midterm or something, and then I want to sort them by alphabetical order, what I kind of do is I start with one, and then I take a second one, and I go, well, do you go before or after you? So OK, I'll put you. Now you two are in order. Now I grab a third one, and I insert you. I basically grab each test, and I stick that new test into the proper place in my little sorted pile. And my sorted pile is growing until I have grabbed everybody, right? That's what I do in real life when I sort stuff. That's what insertion sort is. So um, it is also an n squared algorithm. Let me just show you. I think these algorithms are all easier to understand via pictures. So here's kind of the idea. If the array starts with this data, what you do initially is you say, well, let's think of this first guy as my sorted pile. And inherently, you know, he's sorted. By definition, a pile of size one is sorted, right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the second guy, and I'm just going to try to figure out where he goes with respect to my sorted pile. So he's smaller than my sorted one element pile, so I swap them. So now my sorted pile is this. It's in order. It's size two, right? So now I'm going to look at this third guy, eight, and I want to insert him into my sorted pile in the right spot. And basically the idea is you swap, swap, swap back until they're in the right spot. So 15 is, uh, is uh, you know, too big, so eight swaps back to there. Now my sorted pile is that big. So now the next one is I have a one, and I want to insert him to this sorted pile of like three. So I swap, swap, swap him back to the front. Again, it's not remove and shift and add and shift, it's swap, 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 swap. So each time you look at the next one element and slide him back as far as needed, okay? So, I said on the last slide, I think the last slide said that the runtime is n squared. I want to talk about that. I want to try to convince myself that that's true or help convince you guys that that's true. I also want to talk about different types of data and different arrangements of data and what they would do to the runtime here. So are we convinced that it's n squared? Like does this picture or the algorithm description give you the instinct that it would be n squared? What do you think? Yeah? Yeah, that yellow triangle, it kind of just looks like that, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, each, so this thing, this is like vertically n passes or n times that I'm going to grow my sorted region, right? So this axis is clearly n. The real question is like horizontally how much work are we doing, right? So it kind of depends how many of these little swaps you have to do on each level. What would be a situation where I have to do a lot of swaps versus where I don't have to do a lot of swaps? Sorry, what? So raise your hand. Who's three it? Small. Three, three is small. Well, sure. I mean, the size of the array matters, but I'm just saying for a given size of array, what values in the array or arrangement of values make more swaps versus fewer? Yeah. If the original numbers are in backwards order or close to it, I'm going to have to swap a lot to swap people back to the right place, right? But by contrast, if they're already sorted or close to it, there's not a lot of swapping that needs to occur, right? Because you could go to add the next guy into your sorted pile and you go, hey, he's already bigger than everybody in my sorted pile. I don't do anything. I just leave him where he is. So actually, this algorithm does a lot less work if the array of input is sorted. 
How much less work? It actually does so little work that the runtime drops to O of n if the input is sorted. Because basically on each of these n passes, you start a loop and then immediately stop the loop. So n times you sort of peak but give up on looping again. So that's kind of interesting. If I run insertion sort, let me go back to my top here and I do insertion sort and I run it. This is the same sort of data that selection sort was running on. And you might say, well, I don't remember what we're comparing this to. So let me drop down to here. These are the numbers for selection sort. So do you see that for the same input, insertion is a little bit less? It's a little bit less, 20, 30, I don't know, roughly percent less. Kind of interesting. It still sort of has this like times four, not exactly, but pretty close to times four increase, right? And uh, I always get students who ask me like, well, but it doesn't always seem to jump by four, but I think you kind of want to ignore the little ones because the little numbers are subject to teeny fluctuations, like your computer happens to check your email during that millisecond or something. You know, you want to, the, the larger numbers are more indicative, right? So really up here is where, like look at how close, that's almost exactly times four. That's a better number, you know? So, so okay, that's insertion sort, a little faster. Insertion, paste. I, I, let me check, I was trying to remember, do I have a way that I can feed it? I have a fill random int vector. Do I have a fill sorted int? I do. So, okay, I can't. I'm old, I don't remember anything. So um, if I change this to fill sorted, so the array is already sorted before I even run the algorithm on it, watch how fast insertion sort is. Booyah. <laughs> it finishes like thousands and thousands of elements in no time because it doesn't have to do hardly any work. And you might say, well, can I ever measure the runtime? Well, yeah, of course, of course. You could, you could make n bigger. You know, you could make the max n be that many. I don't remember when it runs out of RAM, but I mean, at some point, you start to see a measurable amount of runtime here, right? Even that's not that many. If you want to measure even more, sometimes what you could do is you could run the algorithm more than one time and clock that. So that also helps. But I mean, basically, if I double the input, the the runtime, these little numbers are hard to read, but it kind of doubles, basically. It, it, it's, about, it's much more of a big O of N if the uh, data is sorted, right? That's pretty cool. Okay, so let me put that back, and let me put this back to be random. So anyway, I think that one's interesting. It's the best one we've seen so far in terms of runtime. It also has these two interesting attributes, you know, that the, uh, oh, this, this interesting attribute that the ordering of the input makes a big difference. In selection sort, I didn't run selection sort on sorted data, but it doesn't help very much because selection sort still for each pass has to walk and look, and once it's done looking, it says, yep, there's nothing I need to do. It walks and walks and walks and says, there's nothing that I need to do. A lot of students try to come up with optimizations and they go, well, what if I wrote selection sort, but first it would walk and look and see if the whole thing was sorted, and if it was, it would just not do all that selection stuff. And it's like, yeah, great, but I mean, most input isn't totally sorted. It's like kind of sorted or mostly sorted. And so then your little optimization doesn't work for any of that. So it's, it, it's hard to like psych this out and try to beat this with some trick in the algorithm, basically. Okay, so th that's insertion sort. Um, any, any questions on the sorts that we've seen so far? Yeah? Oh, like jump to the right place to put it using a, a binary search? Yeah, that's a good idea. I mean. I think what you'll find though is like, even once you find that place, you still have to make room for him there. So you have to move everybody over, which is basically the same as swap, swap, swapping up. You know what I mean? Like you, you might be able to save a small amount of runtime that way, but I think what you'll find is every index that he needs to move, someone else needs to move as well. So uh, I don't think it'll make a big difference, but anyway. Okay, that's insertion sort. Now, all those sorts we've seen so far, uh, the, the ones other than bogus sort, they are uh, sort of swap based, comparison-based sorts, and all sorts of that nature tend to have a, a n-squared runtime. So now let's look at more clever ideas that sort of outside the box that maybe we can go faster. So the first one I want to talk about is merge sort. Some of you guys maybe have heard of merge sort or seen merge sort before. This is a pretty popular sorting algorithm to teach, especially in a class like this. The idea here is take your, your data, that your unsorted you know, array, slice it in half, sort the two halves, and now take the two sorted halves and kind of put them back together into a sorted whole. 
And so, okay, so the claim here is that this could be faster than the other ones that we've seen so far. Um, let me try to, to illustrate. So there's, a, there's an array, size eight. What you could do is you could break it in half, okay? And now you could sort those halves. How do you sort the halves? So, you know, the wrong answer is you say, well, I would call selection sort on each half, or I would call insertion sort on each half. Uh, and that's okay, I actually get that answer a lot, but, but like, of course, this is meant to be a recursive, a self-similar idea. So, oh, I could merge sort each half. <laughs> of course, that only works if our algorithm is correct, but, you know, if you assume that it's gonna work, so I could merge sort the left half, so that would, again, mean splitting that in half, right? And we could merge sort each of those halves and we'd split those in half. This is getting a little silly, but at some point, like you get to a base case with recursion, right? And what's the base case here? Because if you have one element or empty, like there's nothing to do, there's nothing that can be unsorted in a length one subarray. Okay, so those two guys are sorted by nature. And now after the, remember what the algorithm says is you split, sort each half, which is trivially already done, and then you merge them. How do you merge things together? Well, you sort of go pairwise and you, you look at the front of each one and you sort of grab a smaller one and sort of put them into the sorted results, basically. So you would look at these two and say, well, the 18 is smaller and then the 22. So I'll put them back together in that order. So there's the result of that. And then on the right side, I would do the same thing. I split this up. I say, oh, those should be put this way. So now I guess maybe this is the first case where the merging is less trivial. So the way you merge these is you just, again, you just sort of look at the front of them both and you say, which one's smaller? I'll sort of take that one. So I like this guy, I'll take him. And now you compare the 18 to the 12, you know what I mean? You're kind of walking along both and you pick which one's smaller from each start point. So I take this and then I would take this and then I would take this and then I would take this. And so I end up with this over here as my result. I split and I merge. At some point, I basically have done what I said I was gonna do, which is I split in half and then I sorted the halves. And now I walk over the two halves and I merge them all together. I end up with this. So, <laughs> this looks pretty ridiculous and complicated, and I think some people have trouble visualizing why this would be efficient or better than uh, selection sort or insertion sort. It's certainly more code. Uh, you know, that's a classic fallacy people have about big O, like the code being short, like the code for selection sort and insertion sort is pretty compact. But this will take more code than that, but it will be faster, right? Um, okay, so uh, let's talk about if you have these two halves, how do you merge them together? Just as another illustration of that, imagine that you have these two halves right here and you need to merge them. So the fact that you know that they're both sorted, the halves are both sorted, you can take advantage of. I want to copy these eight numbers into a result that's got all of them. So what you do is, you, I mean, you can think of it as like you're pointing at or you have an index at each array at the start. And you just say, which one's smaller? Oh, I like that one, he's smaller. So I take him and I put him in the result and then I move my plus plus is indexed here. Now I compare these two, who's smaller, the 23. So I put them in and I plus plus this index. Now I compare these two, who's smaller, this one. Put him over and I plus plus the. You understand you do this until you've walked through both of them. Do you use them all up? And now you've got a sorted result. How long does this take if this result is length n over there, how long does this take? O of n. It takes O of n, right? Because sort of each of these two, each of these, you take one element and put it over there, right? And you do n of those. So merging takes n time. I need to figure out what the runtime is of merge sort. On every level of the algorithm, I split and I do sorting and then I merge. So I think, I, I love these like spatial thoughts about big O, because that's intuitive, I think. So it's kind of like, what's the area of this kind of, you know? Um, like merging people takes N. So I think of it as like the horizontal, I've got a picture of this somewhere, hold on, don't look at that. Uh, it's kind of like this. For each level of the algorithm, you split the array in half, you split, 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 and then you're putting people back together. So it's kind of like the, the horizontal time of like splitting and merging is sort of an n time, right? Then we just need to figure out how many times do we do it to get the vertical component of this, and then the product of those is basically our runtime. This is not a good proof, but this is kind of intuitive thought about it. So it's kind of like n times this. Well, how tall is this? What's the height of this? Yeah, I guess it's on the slide. Sorry, I shouldn't ask you if it's on the slide, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, uh, it's because you're dividing by two, divided by two, divided by two, divided by two. The number of times you have to divide something by two to get to one is the same as the number of times you have to multiply one by two to get to your thing. And so that's the log base n or base two. So yeah, this is like n times log n. So this becomes n log n instead of n squared. And I hope you guys know by now that n log n is better than n squared. I also hope you have an instinct that n log n is a lot better than n squared. It's not just a little bit better, it's a lot better. So I want to write this with you guys real quick. We have time. So. Um, Remember the algorithm for merge sort, uh, merge sort. The algorithm is split array in half, sort halves, merge halves, right? Okay, so <clears throat> some of these parts are harder than others. <laughs> uh, here, I'll help you with the, the first part. Split in half, there's a nice method, vector of int left equals, there's a method called v dot sublist. Sublist takes a start and a length. So from zero to what is the first half? Yeah, size over two, right? Okay, good. Uh, now we have right vector in right equals v dot sublist the rest of them, right? Uh, and so basically we want from v dot size over two. Do you have to pass the second index? I forget. I should change it so you don't. Oh well. Um, and then like how many elements are in this? I would just say like v dot size minus left dot size. You know what I mean? Because uh, you might say size over two, but there might be odd sizes. It might be one more on the left or on the right or whatever. So whatever, I, I, I take the two halves, right? Okay, that's the first part. Sort halves, hmm, I don't know how to do that. Uh, that's hard. Merge the halves, hmm, that's also hard. Well, okay, we said this was recursive. <laughs> I want you guys to help me with these two parts. I did this part for you guys. That was pretty tricky. So how do I sort the halves? What do I put here? Yes? Merge sort left and merge sort right. Merge, I also wrote mogo sort. Merge <laughs> sort left. That would be like a random recursive. So I just randomly call recursive functions. Oh shit, a fractal. Ah. <laughs> uh, Right. Uh, have you have you heard of uh, my favorite silly sorting algorithm? It's called quantum sort. The idea is uh, see if the array is sorted. If it is, stop. Otherwise, destroy the universe. When you're done, the only universes that exist will be ones where the array is sorted. So you're done. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love it. Try it. You go code that. Try coding that later. Um, <laughs> so yeah, sort the halves. I think that's right. That's a little bit mumbo jumbo. We relies on our, our code working, but I think we'll get it right. So okay, then we have to merge it. This is probably the actually hardest part. Uh, one other thing, this is supposed to be recursive, right? So we're going to keep calling merge sort on the left and merge sort on the right. They have to hit a base case at some point, right? So let's do that right up here. I didn't really think about that. So it's really more like if I should bother to do any work here, I, then I'll do this work, right? So if v dot size is at least two, I should do something, right? And the base case is explicit, is implicitly to do nothing, right? So else base case do nothing, okay. So merge halves, uh, this part's a little bit tricky to write, but I think it's something like, you know, that, that picture on the screen where I just had the different uh, elements and I was just copying them. We could try to mimic this code as best we can. I1 and I2, you know, we could we can do that, right? So int I1 equals zero, int I2 equals zero. And then we're gonna like have a loop where we copy things into back into V from left and from right, right? So I think we're gonna do some sort of loop. Um, I guess we would say like for int I equals zero i is less than v dot size. So, you know, we're going to loop over the indexes of v and put things into each one of them. So at the end of this, we're going to say v i equals something. We're going to take the element from the left or the right, right? So I think we need to figure out, like, if something, I'll take the element from the left, else I'll take the element from the right. So v i equals left i1. You understand? Like, sometimes I'm going to grab from the left, and otherwise I'm going to grab from the right at index i2, right? I haven't written the ifs, I haven't done some, I'm skipping some of the hardest part, right? But uh, there's one thing I would do inside the bodies of these each, right? What else would I do? Yeah, yeah, I should also increase, if you're a hacker, you might want to put it like that, like after I read from that index, then increase the index, or after, I could put a line after the assignment that does that, whatever. So, yeah, 
Okay, uh, how do I know if I should take from the left? I mean, I think the slide said basically just pick the smaller one, right? So you might say, why did Marty skip that part? Okay, well, I guess I would just say if left i1 is less than right i2, if they're the same, it doesn't really matter, so take either one. But that's kind of the right answer, but there's a little more to it than that. I'm, I'm going to have a, a case that would be bad unless I fix it. Uh, yeah? You might hit the end of left or the end of right. In fact, you probably should at some point. Yeah, like if you, if you walk through this, at some point you basically exhaust one or the other, and then there is no left I1, and there is no right I2, or one or the other kind of runs out. You know what I mean? So I think what we should do here is not go check their values unless we're positive that there are remaining values in both arrays. So I think what I want to say is like if there are, th th remember this if is, is um, testing when should I take from the left. So I should take from the left when there are no values left, or no values remaining on the right or the left one is small. Do you know what I'm saying? Like if there's no values remaining on the right, how do I check that? If I2 is greater than or equal to right dot size, right? Something like that. Or I, th I think I even need one more test in here, which is like, or uh, I1 is less than left dot size, and something like that. I might have an unnecessary if there, but something of that nature. Like if we're out of the right or the left one's smaller, we'll take the left. Okay, so I think that's it. I think that's it. Uh, we can run it and test it and see, but once we're done, all the VIs will have been updated to the new values that they're supposedly supposed to have. Um, up here in the main, I have it fill with random data, then it calls merge sort, and just to make sure we didn't goof up the code, like I actually check if it's sorted. <laughs> so if we didn't write it correctly, the code won't let us get away with that. So because that would be, you could find a breakthrough sorting algorithm that doesn't actually sort the data. So I, I think. I think it's working. Uh, it's already done. <laughs> but remember how um, with, uh, with insertion sort, it took, it took 40 seconds to sort 40,000 elements. It takes merge sort a fifth of one second to sort the same amount of data as that. So like, look, big O is important, kids. You know, um, going from n squared to n log n is a really, really freaking big speed up. Okay? And I want you to understand that. So actually, just to really see this runtime, I want to know how many elements can I sort before I get to 40 seconds. That's an interesting question. So let's go up here and change this to be a much bigger number. Let's try it out. <laughs> You're actually taking more time to generate the random list. Yeah, it's actually, it, 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 you can't quite see from this, but like the time it has to take to build the vector and shuffle up the numbers in the vector is longer than it's taking for it to sort the vector, which is funny. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's going to take a while, right? You can sort of extrapolate roughly from these numbers about how many I can sort in 40 seconds. But this is so much faster than selection and insertion. I just, I wanted to write it and run it with you because I really wanted you to see. I just feel like a lot of people initially in their education, they don't have a great instinct for big O. They know it's faster, but I don't know, it's maybe twice, two or three, four times as, you know, it's a little faster. No, it's like way faster. It's orders of magnitude faster. It's, it's so much faster, you just need to do this. You need to do this with the right algorithm, basically. I think, I think my program stopped. I couldn't even, even with this, I didn't get far enough. So it was gonna sort like around 10 million elements in the same amount of time that insertion sort, sorts 40,000 elements. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I'll just copy this so I have this data here, uh, here, like this. So that's merge sort, cool. Um, so, you know, merge sort is quite good, and actually if you, go, if you go download the libraries that come with Java or Python or C++ or whatever, the actual standard libraries that come with these languages, a lot of them use merge sort as their sorting algorithm when you actually sort data. Um, one other sort algorithm that I don't have in my slides is the sorting algorithm that comes with Python, and it's, I love this, it's called Tim sort. That's because a guy named Tim made it up. <laughs> I'm so jealous. I'm like, that's the smartest idea ever. I'm gonna like, I'll tell you what he did, because then I'll tell you my plan after that. So here's, here's Tim sort. So if you're gonna Tim sort a, a vector called V, it's roughly the following. 
if v dot size is less than some number like 20, insertion sort v, else merge sort v. That's basically what Tim sort is. You go Google it. Uh, it might not be 20. I think they measured. So this guy Tim, he did a bunch of measurements of sorting algorithms. And what he found was merge sort obviously much faster than insertion sort, right? But what he found was that at some point, all the splitting and merging and splitting and merging, that does have a cost. And all the recursive calls, it does have a little bit of a cost. And where it really has a high cost is like if you have two elements and you bother to split them and then make a whole recursive call and then merge them just to, mer just to sort two things. You know, that's silly. It's also kind of silly to do that for four things and eight things. Well, how many things, what if I didn't? What if I actually did mostly merge sort, but then once I got down to a pretty small array, then I really just did do insertion sort there. Uh, and he found that that was faster because of reduced function call overhead and splitting and merging vectors and stuff. And so he tweaked and tweaked and measured and he found that there was some value, I think it's around 20 or 40 or 50, you can Google it if you want, Tim sort. And he found like, if I set that size as a constant and do this, my sort goes like 5% faster or 10% faster, something like that. And so that's what's in Python. It's a little different. I mean, Tim sort, there, if, there's variations of Tim sort where you have more choices than just two and more variations of which you choose and so forth. But that's basically the idea. And I'm like, man, Tim, Go for the money, that's great, you know? Now I'm so jealous, I'm gonna invent like Marty's algorithm, which is like Dijkstra's algorithm, but you put Printlin hello at the start, and that's Marty's algorithm. <laughs> I'm gonna get in all the textbooks, uh, just tweak an existing one and get famous, yeah. So for this one, like, merge sort, once like, it splits, and like, that split gets like, down to like, something that's less than 20, would it be like insertion sort on that? Uh, sorry, I'm being a little oversimplified here. I think what I'm, what I, if you really want to take it literally, uh, where is it? Merge sort. It's more like here. Yeah. It's like if left is 20, do insertion, and else do merge. So it's this part. You still do this. So this is where I would insert that if else logic, basically. It's not quite as simple as, as that. Yeah. But anyway, kind of interesting. So I mean, that, that implies that other concept, which is like sometimes a variety of sorts can be clever, can be useful in a certain situation. So merge sort is pretty great. Merge sort is what a lot of languages use, or a variation of it, like Tim sort, is what a lot of languages use. Uh, let me show you one more that, you know, when I have a ton of time left, but this one can be even a little faster than merge sort. It's called quick sort, because <laughs> it's quick. Uh, I, I always laugh, because you know, the guy who invented quick sort, his name was Hor. And so it's like, he didn't want to call it poor sort, you know? They're like, we're going to have to come up with something else. Uh, can we do, can we call it quick sort? That would be a little better. Uh, uh, yeah, anyway. So quick sort is pretty similar to merge sort in the sense that you uh, divide and conquer a little bit. But it has this different, interesting idea. The idea is you pick one of the elements of the vector. And I can talk about how you pick, which one do you pick in a second. But you pick one of the elements, and you say this element is going to be called the pivot element, OK? So now what you're going to do is you need to make it so that your array is arranged such that all the values that are less than that pivot's value, like if you happen to pick a number of this value, 42, you need to arrange the array so that all the elements whose value are less than 42 come earlier, and all the val values that are greater than 42 come later. Now, that kind of sounds like uh, there's a lot of mumbo jumbo to that. But if you were to do that, that wouldn't sort the array. Because you know if all the elements less than 42 are over here, but they're still jumbled up. But I know they're all less than 42. And all the elements greater than 42 are over here, but they're all jumbled up. That's sort of something, but it doesn't mean that I'm sorted. But if I kept doing that, like what if within that less than 42 region, I picked another pivot and it was 20. So then I moved all the less than 20 people and all the greater than, so within those little subdivisions, I would keep doing this pivoting stuff. Eventually, you get a sorted array if you keep doing that. The question really is just like, is this a fast, a good way to do sorting? I'm telling you that it is because it's the substance of this algorithm, but it's hard to have an intuition that this would work well. But let me kind of show you how it works. So here's a list with random contents. The algorithm works no matter what you pick as the pivot, as long as you keep going long enough. So actually, if you want to write a really simple version of QuickSort, you just take the first element. So whatever his value is, that's the pivot. Let's go. Um, so sometimes you, know, it, you can pick a bad pivot. You want the pivot to sort of roughly be a median value of the array. You want to sort of partition half the people here, half the people there, if you can, if you're lucky. So like this data here, what would be a good pivot? Well. I don't know, I didn't really look at the numbers ahead of time, but 
30, 40, so I don't know, something like that. You want to kind of have half the elements on each side of it. So there's some strategies for quicksort of like, how do you pick a really good pivot? Um, you can just randomly pick an index. Let me back up, actually. So because you want to split it evenly, you want a pivot that splits it evenly. So what's an example of data or pivots that would be really bad? It would be if you always were picking the biggest or the smallest element as the pivot. That would be very, not very useful, do you understand? So <clears throat> you can run into trouble if you just always grab the first one as the pivot because if the data was sorted or reverse sorted, that would mean that your pivot was maximally badly chosen, basically. So what some people do is they just pick a random index and what some other people do is they look at like three indexes and they pick the, the median value of those three indexes. There's just different strategies of what you do. Let me try to draw you a, uh, uh, let's see, don't I have a picture of this? Wait, here we go, okay, so if you have a pivot, so let's assume that my pivot is eight. Sorry, I think this slide is a little confusing, but in this array here, maybe eight is the first uh, index. So let's say I pick eight as my pivot. You move them to the end, you get them out of the way just for a second. Okay, swap them to the end. Now what you do is you start two indexes at the endpoints of the rest of the array, eight and zero, and you walk them toward each other. And the idea is if you see something on the left that's larger than eight, that's bad. And if you see something on the right that's less than eight, that's bad. So if, if that one's big and this one's small, those are bad. So you swap them and then you keep moving in, swap, 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 swap. And then when you're done, you end up with everybody partitioned. So I'm trying to draw a picture of this, but basically, you have J, I and J, and you walk across, <laughs> you see, so, it's hard to, hard to draw a picture of. So wait, what did I pick? Is my pivot six? Sorry, sorry, I think I, I set this up wrong, I apologize. The pivot is this first guy's six. So what I do is I swap him from the front to the end. So I'm kind of moving him out of the way. Okay, move him over here. Six is a pivot. Now I start walking my, my guys inward from I and J from the endpoint. So what I'm looking for is like people who are bigger than six on the right are good. So I just kind of walk past them. But if I see somebody who's less than six over here, that's bad. So Jay's going to stop right there, this guy. And over here on the I side, I'm looking for people who are, um, who are greater than six. So basically my algorithm stops with I here and J there because this, this eight is out of place and this two is out. See that? So then I swap them and then I just keep going. And if I just keep doing that, I end up in a state where all the people less than six are on the left and all the people greater than six are on the right. Yeah, no. And then the index where I and J meet is the sort of middle of that, and then that's where I put the pivot back. That's where I put six back afterwards. No. So now after this, it isn't sorted, right? But it's kind of a little more sorted-ish than it used to be. You see that? I mean, it's kind of getting closer to being sorted. So now I recursively quick sort this pink part and I quick sort this highlighter on the yellow green part here. And if you just keep doing this, eventually your array gets sorted. It's kind of hard to see, especially given that my slides are confusing. But, um, oh, here's another example. Here's pivot 65. Move 65 to the end, and I walk in. I like these two guys here, but then, let's see. Uh, I swap 65 to the end, and I don't like this 81 here, because he's too big. I don't like this 16 here because they're too small, so I swap them. And now I keep moving in until I find other ones that I don't like, which are these two, and I swap them, and I walk in, and eventually I get this. So that's the idea. Okay, well, how long does this walking across and swapping stuff take? How long does that take to do once? O of n, right? You walk the array until they meet. That takes n. How many times do I have to do it? What's the height of the runtime? Well, if the, if the like recursion, because the recursive call is going to be on this part, right? This green part and on this pink part. So if those two parts are about half as big each, that's kind of merge sorting, right? We're half, 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 half. So that's kind of logish. This is n and this is kind of log. That only is true if these sides are kind of roughly half each, right? So if I pick these pivots well, this will take n log n time, just like merge sort did. But then the question is, is it actually better or worse than merge sort? It might seem like it's about the same as merge sort. Well, we can just run it and see. I've got it implemented, I've got it written. You can look at the code for it later if you want to. If I run quick sort, <clears throat> here's what I get. I think what you'll see is it's a little faster. 
It's actually pretty substantially faster. It's about two or three times as fast on this data. I've seen on a lot of other programming languages and libraries, the difference is not quite this pronounced. Um, there is something about how we implemented merge sort that is non-optimal. The part where we split the thing in two, the vector in two, and then merge them back together, you actually technically don't have to literally make a whole other vector for that part. You could just think of the sub-ranges as being conceptually two smaller vectors and sort them, do you know what I mean? So like you could make merge sort more efficient than we did. So anyway, this is a little exaggerated uh, in terms of the difference. I would say often quick sort is maybe one and a half times as fast as merge sort or less. It's not usually so pronounced. But you will still notice the growth here. The growth of something that's n log n, it's like a little more than double each time. A little more than double, not times four, you understand? Because double would be order n. Double plus a little is n log n. And that's basically the growth we have here. It's a little more than doubling each time. So that's quick sort. It's n log n slightly better than merge sort. Now, I just told you a second ago, this is the last thing I'll say before we go. I just told you a second ago that a lot of programming languages use merge sort or tim sort. Why don't they use quick sort? It's because of a particular property of quick sort versus merge sort called stable sorting. I'll just tell you this as a going away comment. Um, if you sort by one thing and then sort by another thing, you sort by primary and then secondary ordering. The issue is, after that, is it still sorted with respect to the first thing? If so, it's a stable sort. If not, it isn't. Merge sort is stable and quick sort is not, which a lot of people want their sorts to be stable, which is why quick sort is not used as much. Anyway, okay, I'm out of time. Uh, all these algorithms are in the code on today's lecture. If you want to look at them, uh, have fun with homework eight. I'll see you guys on Wednesday for our last lecture of content.